When it comes to adult animation, there are a handful of cartoons that push the limit when it came to exploring their mature rating. What could they get away with? What would the censors allow? When was too much, too much? Believe it or not, there was a time when The Simpsons was considered too risque for television. There was also a time when South Park was looked upon as public enemy number one for its dark and offensive humor. But there is a show that aired during the mid-2000s that was so unhinged, so depraved, so controversial that it made other adult cartoons look tame by comparison. Drawn Together Drawn Together is the living embodiment of 2000s edgy humor and is often regarded as one of the most daring and boundary-pushing animated series of all time. Virtually nothing was off-limits. The show itself was an animated parody of house-based reality TV shows that were popular at the time, such as The Real World and Big Brother. But instead of having real people, Drawn Together featured satirical copies of iconic cartoon characters instead. Wooldor for Spongebob, Toot for Betty Boop, and Ling Ling for Pikachu, to name a few. But these characters were demented to the core. Even by 2000 standards, Drawn Together had an exceptionally shocking and callous sense of humor. Did you tie her up and chase? Did he have a big stick? Did you slap her around? Did he make you suck his big ball? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The show would run for three seasons with a total of 36 episodes and was surprisingly popular, especially with the coveted college student demographic. It was right behind South Park in the ratings, yet Drawn Together would eventually be canceled and took said cancellation very personally. So much so that they would even mock South Park for its favoritism with Comedy Central and critics. Drawn Together is the lamest show ever! Watching it was like watching taint dry! And if I let you get a point, you might get your time slot back! Why the f*** would I do that?! <laughs> what exactly happened? How did such a successful show get cancelled? Did it cross the line? And why do the showrunners have so much contempt for South Park? They obviously had an axe to grind and dedicated their direct-to-video movie as a way of giving the middle finger to South Park. Strap in, folks. The story for Drawn Together is truly unique, uncomfortable, and very bizarre. It's a cartoon unlike anything else, and I doubt we'll ever see something of its caliber ever again. For the record, this video was written and edited to comply with YouTube's ad-friendly rules. Unfortunately, we will not be able to show the full context of Drawn Together, but the history and the context behind this show will remain fully intact. That being said, if you do end up liking the video, please consider leaving a like and a comment, and perhaps even subscribing to the channel. My team and I worked for over a year on this project, knowing it could be compromised by YouTube for its subject matter. But the history of Drawn Together is important, and a surprisingly relevant story to tell. Also, before we get to the video, I would like to thank the sponsor of this upload, Factor. It's November now, which means holidays and the ever stressful end of the year crunch. Work, school, you know the drill. Now more than ever, it is so tempting to just phone it in with fast food. But what if I told you there was a better option? One that is convenient and better than fast food. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever before by delivering fresh, never-frozen, dietitian-approved meals right to your doorstep. With Factor, you don't have to waste money on fast food. Also, you save time you might have spent at the grocery store doing food prep, cooking, and cleaning dishes. With Factor, you're saving time, getting flavor, and the nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. For me, the Herb Crust Chicken is my absolute favorite. Also, Factor has keto-friendly options for those who are of that persuasion, such as myself. Again, they have dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Definitely a great way to watch that waistline, especially during this time of the year. Trust me, <laughs> I know. So head to Factor75.com or click the link down below and use code SABERSPARK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That is, once again, Factor75.com 
or click the link down below and use code SABERSPARK50 to get 50% off. I legit love Factor. I appreciate them sponsoring this video. Go hit them up today. All right, on that note, let's begin. You didn't have to do that for me. I didn't do it for you. I did it for us. Oh, during the early 2000s, television experienced a tremendous breakthrough of new and challenging entertainment for audiences. It was dubbed the second golden age of TV, lasting from 1999 to arguably the present day. And with it came a wide variety of high-budget shows being made on the regular. The creation of prestige dramas like The Sopranos and Lost changed the standards of what audiences could expect from cable television. They were establishing a higher caliber of storytelling hour-long high-tension episodes that kept eager viewers coming back the following week. For those who don't remember, or physically did not exist before it, the early 2000s was a very strange time for entertainment. But with it came a few slow-burn properties like Arrested Development or Freaks and Geeks, which became classic series in their own right. The boundaries for what was acceptable in a comedy show, especially after prime time, were being pushed to the furthest they could get away with. This is likely due to the more relaxed content restrictions from censors and networks for shows airing after 10 p.m. This time slot is considered just after prime time, and when younger audiences are more likely to be asleep and avoid mature content. Now, how accurate this is by today's standards is unclear, but in 2004, access to late-night adult-oriented shows was more streamlined to channel surfing or watching recordings on TiVo. Ah, uh, TiVo. A TV guide, Netflix delivering DVDs in the mail. All concepts that are most likely foreign to younger audiences nowadays who have the blessing of instant gratification via the internet. Like it is crazy to think that there was a time where people would sit and watch nearly 15 minutes of ads for 45 minutes worth of television. Yeah, to those who think a, a one minute in video sponsorship is bad, ho ho ho, you have no idea what true suffering is. Uh, getting back on topic, mid-2000s television was truly something else. What other era could give us both Dane Cook selling out Madison Square Garden and Jeff Dunham, a problematic ventriloquist with racist puppets at the same time? I still genuinely cannot believe that last one was real. But hey, here we are. Hell, the guy even got a live-action TV show and a cartoon based on one of his puppets. <laughs> uh, Jeff Dunham truly ruled the 2000s with a cringy iron fist. Oh, is there an unusual kind of guy? What makes you happiest in life? My BMW? Oh, he has a BMW. Yeah, big Mexican woman. <laughs> oh my god, bro. <laughs> now, with this change in the TV landscape came a few distinct outliers, especially in the world of animated adult comedies. After a rocky few early seasons, South Park became a massive ratings giant for Comedy Central, opening the door for other animated shows to follow suit, though very few would even hope to capture the same level of success. Then you got Family Guy, a show that was resurrected from early cancellation on Fox due to the high ratings of reruns airing on Adult Swim, along with its wildly successful DVD sales. Times were changing in the mid-2000s and the demand for adult animated comedies was growing louder and louder. Admittedly, this cavalier environment for entertainment led to some relics of the time being difficult to rewatch now, mostly because of how dated and uncomfortable some of the humor is. Comedy Central's Little Bush is probably the most mid-2000s things ever made, and Crank Anchors is, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe the less said the better. Well, what you need to do is learn how to use a toilet. So you're not going to bring the turd back to me? No, I'm starting to like it. <laughs> but among these contemporaries, an ambitious animated show on Comedy Central called Drawn Together emerged in 2004. It was developed by Dave Jesser and Matt Silverstein, both childhood friends and comedy writers from Inglewood, New Jersey. Up to that point, the pair had worked together writing for shows such as Third Rock from the Sun, Greg the Bunny, and The Man Show. But once more, it is crazy how much culture has shifted since the 2000s. It is like night and day compared to today's sensibilities. Now, Dave and Matt's original premise was simple yet effective. 
an ensemble of legally distinct cartoon characters living together in a house who would participate in various challenges and engage in humorous hijinks. This was the mid-2000s, and the reality TV trend was in full swing. So to take that concept and to put an animated spin on it? Well, it was a stroke of genius. Instead of having the stereotypical cast of live-action actors, we'd have cartoon characters from different genres of animation, all drawn in their respective styles. The concept worked as a joke in and of itself, since a cartoon by its nature cannot be reality. Though, since most reality shows are heavily scripted, or at least manipulated by the people behind the show to a large degree, you could also read the premise as a comment on the nature of reality TV in general. In October of 2003, Dave and Matt pitched their concept to Comedy Central using a short test done in Flash. The producers were doing their best to suss out an audience by being upfront about exactly what to expect during the show. As quoted in Variety, Jesser states, quote, anything adults can do on a reality show, we want our characters to do, end quote. And good lord, would they do that, plus so much more. The pitch meeting was a smashing success, and Drawn Together was immediately picked up for seven episodes by the network, with the series premiering the following year on October 27, 2004. Animated Hell was about to be unleashed. On the next Drawn Together. I say we smash the cameras and blow the whole house up! Tensions in the house boil over. Let's do this! Then, two chicks gelatin wrestle. <laughs> Plus, the best boardroom yet. Actually, the only boardroom yet on this show. Someone is getting fired. Ooh. Drawn together, an all-new episode of TV's first animated reality show, Wednesday at 10.30. Oh, by the way, folks, I got new merch. I guess this is what the kids call a merch drop. We got a boomer! Did I use that term right? Hopefully. Yeah, this is like the first official one. I've done like some t-shirts before, but look at this. That's official. You got the Saberverse poster. You get a beanie with my face on it. You got my mug on the mug. T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Sabi Spark. The whole gang is here. So if you want to support the channel, go hit up the link in the description down below. Again, I really appreciate the support. Go check it out. All right, on that note, back to the video. I had to find help and nothing could stop me. Absolutely no. Ooh, is that a hot topic? Ooh, I hear they got officially licensed. Saber Spark merch. Using their late night time slot to the fullest extent, Drawn Together made fun of everything. Gay marriage, racism, basically every single form of abuse you can think of eating disorders, and other things I absolutely cannot mention directly due to <laughs> YouTube. Yeah, thanks for that, guys. Really appreciate not being able to talk about this thing in full context, but hey, them the breaks. Folks, if you want to see the full version of this review, the one that also includes uncensored clips of Drawn Together for full context, then go check it out on my Patreon right now. Link is in the description. Let's just say it's very dirty, all right? Okay, moving on. So, each week, Drawn Together examines how the characters interact, living in a house full of cameras, and their changing relationship dynamics. Each member of the cast also fulfills a character archetype, typically seen in reality TV shows of the era. The bitch, the outsider, the gay one, you get the idea. Think Total Drama Island, but with more swearing and boobs. And somehow less farting, I know, I was shocked too. Jesser and Silverstein knew this wasn't going to be a show for everyone. They were deliberate in this by using provocative marketing for season one. Print ads and billboards use spicy images of Foxy and Clara with a tagline, find out what happens when cartoon characters stop being polite and start making out in hot tubs. With that kind of mission statement, Drawn Together was destined to be an incredibly divisive program. First impressions from critics found the pilot both tasteless and offensive, with most of the humor coming from the characters actually embracing the same stereotypes they claim to be ridiculing. In one review from the New York Times, writer Virginia Heffernan enjoyed the concept, but felt that they could not stick the landing when it came to satire. Virginia said, quote, With the deck so skillfully loaded, drawn together should hit joke after joke, but somehow the show confines each character to one-liners. You'll want to look away, and the characters do little but revert to type, as if nothing the show's creators can dream up will ever be as satisfying as their preliminary character descriptions." End quote. 
Despite this, early fans of Drawn Together, especially college students, loved it for daring to go where other adult cartoons weren't willing to, with a crude combination of violence, sex, and raunchy humor. Additionally, they had an incredibly lucky Wednesday night time slot, immediately following South Park and right before The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. This was THE peak watch time for Comedy Central, giving them consistently high ratings and proving it was a big hit for the network. But resonating with a young demographic is one thing. How does Drawn Together as a show hold up though? Especially now. Is the show still funny or relevant today? The answer to that is, uh, mixed to say the least. This is definitely an eye the beholder kind of situation, folks. Let's start off with the nucleus of the show, the characters. Like I said before, the concept of Drawn Together was to bring together eight characters from different animation styles and put them in a reality show style setting. Captain Leslie Hero is a parody of superheroes who embody various negative traits, like being sociopathic, chauvinistic, and perverted. His design is influenced by the works of Bruce Timm and Max Fleischer, and his personality is a combination of characters like Superman, Mr. Majestic, Hyperion, and more. Leslie is also prone to sudden fits of hysteria, a common trope in superhero stories. Woldor Jebediah Sockbat is a hyperactive and gullible children's show character who displays strange and unrealistic behaviors. He's reminiscent of characters like SpongeBob and Roger Rabbit. Uh, Princess Clara is a bigoted and religious princess who mocks Disney princesses like Ariel and Belle. She's homophobic, loves to sing, and carries herself as a bit holier than thou. Foxy Love is a parody of the character Valerie Brown from the show Josie and the Pussycats. She is a sharp-tongued and promiscuous musician who solves mysteries. Toot Bronstein is a chubby and egotistical old-timey sex symbol who is modeled after Betty Boop. She is attention-seeking, self-harming, and often instigates conflict in the house. Probably THE most abrasive character on the show. Xander P. Wifflebottom is a parody of JRPG heroes like Link from The Legend of Zelda and Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII. He's hypersensitive, gay, and effeminate. Uh, by the way, I always found it weird that Xander, a video game character, was included as a cartoon character, but whatever. Then there's Spanky Ham, a sex-obsessed and toilet-humored anthropomorphic pig who is based on various internet flash cartoon characters. Ling Ling is a psychopathic anime character who is influenced by, you guessed it, Pokemon. He battles by using supernatural powers and speaks in this pseudo-Japanese with English subtitles. And that, folks, is our main cast of characters. Along with them includes a, let's say, colorful ensemble of side characters such as the producer and huh, others. We won't go into detail about others. You see, many of you annoying cartoon characters show up at Hot Topic looking for merchandise from your insipid shows. <laughs> Now, one of the most interesting things about Drawn Together is the animation and how each character is rendered. While most cartoons have a singular art style, Drawn Together leans into the multifaceted sources that its cast hail from. Captain Hero is drawn with angular streamlined anatomy that Bruce Timm popularized with Batman the Animated Series. Wuldor looks like something out of a nightmare episode of SpongeBob. Spanky Ham has flat colors and thick outlines. Reminiscent of the simple style of amateur Flash cartoons at the time he lampoons. Clara is drawn with colored outlines, like characters from the Disney Renaissance. Foxy has proportions similar to Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and she lacks eye whites, just like how the studio tended to draw their characters' faces back in the day. Ling Ling uses more limited animation and frequently is drawn with speed lines and other anime exaggerations, and Tude is rendered in black and white. Probably the only character not directly drawn in the aesthetic of the source material is Xander, since he'd probably be either a low-poly 3D model or pixel art, being a parody of video games. But that was probably too technically complex or simply beyond the budget for the show, so he's rendered in traditional 2D. Like, I'm still blown away at how great the animation quality is, especially juggling eight different character styles at the same time. We can credit the team at Rough Draft Studios for that, because this show was no small feat to create. Is this your live action, cow? 
Another strength of Drawn Together is the voice acting. This includes Tara Strong, Cree Summer, Jess Harnell, Jack Plotnick, Adam Carolla, and Abby McBride. Many of these voice actors are on record saying that acting for Drawn Together is some of the most fun they've ever had working on a show. Like they really brought their A-game to this cartoon. And yeah, I'm sure it's gotta be a nice change of pace to do something this outlandish after doing a ton of children's cartoons. This is an acting job unlike anything they've ever had and ever will have. First of all, I love the guys who created that show, Matt Silverstein and Dave Jesser, amazing guys, two of my absolute favorite comic writers of all time. I would go to table reads and read this stuff and I'd be like, there's no way. I, oh, there were a few lines. There were a few lines. I'm like, I'm not saying yeah, that. Yeah. But, but very few, you know, in the scheme of things. But it was more like, I'm like, this is going to be funny to see how much of this, you know, because I'm thinking like 80% of it. Air, yeah. It all made it to air. It all made it to air. The chances they yeah. took on that show, oh, yeah. they, was, they took the envelope, put it in a paper shredder, and set it on fire. Right. Also, I was told by folks on my Twitter that the Spanish dub for Drawn Together goes stupid hard and is a big hit in Mexico and other Latin American countries. It is gay. No. But that leads us to the fiery heart and depraved soul of Drawn Together, the writing. One of the hallmarks of the show was its willingness to push the limits of what was considered acceptable in a cartoon, especially back in 2004. While Comedy Central had other heavy hitter adult animation, most notably South Park, Drawn Together was much more of a shock comedy that pushed boundaries in a much more erratic, irreverent fashion. Whereas South Park was evolving from simple juvenile humor of its earlier seasons into becoming a bit more poignant with its social commentary. Drawn Together was more like early South Park on steroids, where humor was done mostly for humor's sake, just to see how far they could push the line. The show was often raunchy, filled with sexual innuendos and controversial social commentary. The characters were all exaggerated caricatures designed to mock and subvert the classic cartoon stereotypes they represented. No social group, sexual orientation, or hot button issue was off the table for the show. And the marketing reveled in egging on anyone with a stomach too weak to handle what the show was throwing at you. The first episode of the series had Foxy and Clara making out in a hot tub, which was pretty edgy for 2004. And Comedy Central absolutely ran with this using the image of them mid makeout as the headlining image for promotion leading up to the series debut. On the next Drawn Together, two of these housemates will be exploitatively filmed as they make out with Tuck. Primarily, Drawn Together succeeded when they kept things simple, using vulgar, in-your-face comedy with a unique production design. Additionally, I have to mention the wide variety of original music featured in the show. They parody a ton of music styles, from show tunes, ballads, and more within the series, starting right out the gate with Black Chick's Tongue, directly making fun of a whole new world from Aladdin. In fact, only two episodes of the entire show don't have a musical number in them, so I definitely appreciate the amount of time they put into making so many weird songs. My personal favorite is Sunshine, but you can decide for yourself by checking them out online or on Spotify. Just for the love of God, wear headphones. Otherwise, you're about to get a ton of weird looks. Sunshine and a good time for your full day. There's a ton of creativity here, but the show still has its fair share of weaknesses. It wasn't just that Drawn Together was aggressively offensive and isolated their audience on purpose. Rather, it tried and often failed to deliver a barely shoehorned message at the last minute to address some kind of social commentary alongside provocative comedy. I guess they felt they needed one to justify the overall plot of an episode. But I don't think they actually accomplished it, and in some ways end up almost endorsing the same criticisms they claim to be making fun of. I get why the producers wanted to try and have it both ways. But there's a lack of subtlety and balance in the storytelling that really dulls whatever message they were trying to convey, even when most people probably would not have expected them to make a genuine statement in the first place. They don't treat it seriously, so why should we care? Let's use the Season 2 band episode Terms of Endearment for this scenario. And yes, I know it was supposed to originally air in Season 1 and was delayed due to fighting with the network. I know, don't be a nerd in the comments. Or be a nerd in the comments, who cares? Captain Hero accidentally gives Foxy a brain tumor from using his X-ray vision on her. This causes her to revert to a highly racist 1940s caricature, 
and she is taken to a permanent erasement facility, along with a group of other politically incorrect cartoons. The mastermind behind this plan is revealed to be none other than Mickey Mouse, a clear criticism of censorship used by the Walt Disney Company. Now, they've had a messy history of denying the existence of racist cartoons from their own past, locking them away in the Disney vault to seem more socially conscious by today's standards. I agree with them bringing this up, as it's a good point to make. Even though it's an absolutely messed up and shameful part of history, trying to censor or belittle the impact of how those depictions have affected generations of people is wrong. In a direct parallel, one of Disney's competitors, Warner Brothers, has been issuing disclaimers on digital and DVD editions of their older cartoons since 2006, with the following message. For a company as large as Warner, this statement is both candid but honest about addressing their controversial past head-on. By preserving history as it was, we can actively work on making future media more inclusive for everybody. This is the one thing I'm willing to praise past Warner Brothers for right now. Current Warner Brothers, though? <laughs> Do better. This is embarrassing. I'm talking about you, Zaslav. So, when did Disney start making similar disclaimers on their films? Well, November 2019, when Disney Plus was launched. But the initial wording of these disclaimers actually got a lot of controversy with just a tiny blurb after the film synopsis stating, quote, This program is presented as originally created. It may contain outdated cultural depictions, end quote. Not inaccurate or harmful, mind you, just outdated. Language and phrasing matters. You can't just hand wave stuff like this away. So yeah, people were angry they did not make a stronger statement. And after some input from minority sensitivity groups, Disney later fixed this disclaimer the following year in October of 2020. Circling back, I agree with Drawn Together on wanting to bring it up. But what sucks is that the character who addresses it, Spanky Ham, is also the first housemate to actively enjoy Foxy's abrupt change in personality. He's literally dancing with glee, watching her revert to an even worse stereotype than the show was already using for her. Like, whatever they're trying to do with this, I don't think the writers get how mixed the message comes across to an audience. In a situation like this, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It comes across as a flimsy excuse rather than a genuine anti-censorship statement. And keep in mind, this is not the first time Spanky has used racism as his primary reason for helping somebody else. In Super Nanny, Spanky only wants to help Ling Ling pass his driver's test, to enact a pervasive stereotype for his own amusement. Afterwards, Ling Ling ends up with a concussion, with the other housemates blaming Spanky for the fiasco. Unconvinced, Waldor posing as a doctor, uh, <laughs> physically adjusts Ling Ling's eyesight to see differently. After he passes a driver's test, Ling Ling's personality changes, and other Asian characters accuse him of renouncing his heritage until he undoes a procedure at the end of the episode. Yeah, everybody sucks here, but Spanky got them involved for all the wrong reasons. Okay, fine, not everything needs to be treated with nuance, especially in a show like this where subtlety goes to die. But what about the comedy itself? Is the show funny? You know what? Uh, yeah, kind of. If you're not easily offended or have a high tolerance for cringe and shock humor. But is the comedy balanced? Uh, not really. The ratio of jokes relative to the story is high. Like, I'm talking 70% jokes to 30% story. It's incredible for rapid-fire comedy, because usually the jokes hit one after the other with some incredible one-liners. While re-watching it, I was dumbfounded at how weirdly aggressive the humor was. But I gotta admit, it got me to laugh sometimes. Even if the setup and delivery is solid, often the plot gets so murky that it's difficult to keep track of which episode you're watching. Sometimes they just fully give up with the A plot and focus more on the B plot, which the writers also directly address in an episode. Yay! Thank God I'm in the other story. And while this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it does a disservice to the show as a whole. You don't have to take every aspect of your story seriously, but there should be a reason to care about what's happening or making it interesting enough to keep watching. It did not start out this way, though. In season one, they worked very closely to the original premise, with each episode following a standard reality show concept 
i.e. The Real World, American Idol, Big Brother, and so on. These competition framing devices help to anchor the plot and tell cohesive arcs in 22 minutes, all while still being outrageous and gross. Let's use episode 104, Requiem for a Reality Show, as an example. The housemates compete to get food for a week, doing a completely insane and obviously unfair challenge. The team who loses all go hungry and resort to drastic measures to eat. Bullied by Spanky, Waldor manipulates Clara into singing, killing her woodland animal friends for meat. Captain Hero begins a transactional BDSM relationship with Foxy, getting paid with food for sexual favors. Toot binge eats grotesque amounts of food, but takes terrible advice from both Xander and Foxy, developing a series of eating disorders to lose the weight. Sure, there's tons of edgy stuff at play, but it makes sense for how things progress during the episode. And by the end of season one, this reality show framing device was dropped entirely. It seems like they either ran out of concepts they wanted a parody, or straight up just got bored of using it. As a result, season two and three become more episodic and designed to maximize outrageous jokes along with a topical subject from the mid-2000s. Steroid usage, gay marriage, and so on. What started as a funny and inventive premise eventually becomes an over-reliance on direct references, excessive running gags, and homages that feel more lazy than reverential. Let's take a moment to remember some of our family who we've lost over this past season. May they all rot in hell. Amen. They can start off kind of funny at first, but quickly overstay their welcome, becoming annoying and tedious to watch. By far, the extended running gags are one of the biggest weaknesses of the show. Characters having lengthy conversations off screens, farts that last way too long, recycling animation. It's like, oh my god, we get it, just move on already. But what got to me the most, though, was the characters degrading in quality over time, going through the rough process of flanderization. Originally from TV tropes, uh, this term refers to a character's established personality traits becoming overly simplified, and instead becoming their whole personality. For example, the term is named after Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, who goes from being Homer's annoying but well-meaning goody-two-shoe neighbor into an exhausting Christian right figurehead. Seasonal rot can happen to the best of shows over the years, especially when changing writing teams or increasing episode demands from the network, who often value quantity over quality. But it only took a few seasons for the drawn-together housemates to lose what little development they had. The characters become, and stay, the worst versions of themselves, especially in season 3 and the movie. It's not enough that Clara is accidentally bigoted during season one, being raised as a spoiled and isolated princess. In season two, they dial this up even further, with Clara using her religious beliefs as both a shield and a justification for hatred. She tries to stop a gay wedding between Spanky and Xander, who were trying to get married for health insurance, and later uses the veggie fables to repress Waldor's blooming sexuality. By season three, she becomes a full-on hyper-conservative stereotype, a racist, homophobic, fundamentalist Christian, eagerly waiting for the rapture. Clara becomes so cruel and unlikable in season three that she's even willing to secretly poison and abuse Waldor on purpose to get positive attention from her housemates. During the previous season in the Lemon Aids walk, Clara was best friends with Waldor, wanting him to run a lemonade stand with her. Obviously, I'm not expecting there to be substantial continuity in a show like this, but I think the writing really struggles when there's a lack of consistency in the characters' relationships building over time. They toy with the idea, but it ultimately does not make that big of a difference when the plot demands otherwise. Like, Spanky is almost always used as a bad influence on Waldor and Ling Ling, but frequently having him be the mouthpiece for the moral of the story is just a weird choice considering he usually pushed them to those extremes in the first place. The most consistent character from beginning to end is probably, uh, guess who? Captain Hero. Whether or not that's a good thing in this case, I really don't know. Personally, I would have appreciated a little less incest from him. Not gonna lie, there's a 
a lot he does. There's a there's a lot there's a lot that he does. Uh, you would think that like Homelander is pretty bad. Uh uh. No, Homelander looks like a saint compared to Captain Hero, and I mean it. That's what honestly frustrates me the most about Drawn Together. The characters just become whatever the plot demands of them. It makes it difficult to care or keep track of the story when each character eventually ends up being a homicidal, unhinged monster and their individual arcs don't matter. The showrunners themselves address this lack of consistency quite a bit, with tons of meta jokes breaking the fourth wall, talking about how much the show sucks. But whether or not this acknowledgement actually proves or justifies anything is minimal. Mostly, it comes off as an immature excuse to just be offensive without having any real purpose. You can make a statement about something being wrong, but when you keep showing worse depictions of it in the same show, it renders the argument pointless and unnecessary. Drawn together frequently walks the line of being able to laugh at themselves, but still acknowledges a lot of the criticisms leveled against them. They go so far as to actually use a scathing review of the first episode from Entertainment Weekly, with the characters launching a killing spree at the magazine office and confronting the writer, why take the high road when we can salt the earth instead, right? Unsurprisingly, Drawn Together left a massive impact on the animated television landscape. Many people loved it, and many people hated it. Hell, the show was so influential that it even inspired the anime studio Gainax to create Panty and Stalking. <laughs> it's wild to think that between the two series, Panty and Stalking is still the more reserved of the two. But despite the success of Drawn Together and running for three seasons, despite being a huge hit with a sought-after demographic, the show would implode by its own hands. Drawn Together was on the verge of cancellation, but it was not about to leave before giving the biggest middle finger to both Comedy Central and South Park on its way out. The Drone Together have been canceled. Canceled? Despite the high ratings of Drawn Together, it was always on the brink of cancellation for a number of factors. First off, it was extremely expensive to produce, with each episode costing roughly $700,000 each and an estimated nine months of production time, which gradually impacted their airing schedule. Unsurprisingly, animation is not cheap. Second, given the subject matter of the show, most advertisers did not want to be associated with Drawn Together, even if the viewership was high. Which, uh, <laughs> yeah, can't say I blame them. Like, can you imagine the look on the face of an executive from a company? after seeing their commercial attached to Drawn Together. Ford Tough, the only truck for sexual predators like Captain Hero. Yes! Ooh, I like that bitch, don't I? And finally, and most embarrassingly, the creators of the show, Jesser and Silverstein, grew complacent during season three, lacking the same passion and motivation to get episodes done on time. They actually admitted to this, claiming the second half of season three was so bad because they were actively wasting their time watching too much YouTube and playing Halo on their Xbox. Listen, Dave, Matt, we've all been there, but you never publicly brag about it. Nobody will feel sorry for you. That was the reason why season three had a staggered airing schedule. Part one aired in early October of 2006 then took a long break until part two aired the following year in October of 2007, with a musical clip show acting as a series finale, which is like exceptionally lazy and lame. One house to hold us all, eight different kinds of characters, letting it all hang out in front of one million cameras, we're drawn together. Let's all relive this creepy Captain Hero moment. It was a strange problem for Comedy Central to grapple with. They had a hit show that was their second highest rated program on their network. And it also appealed to college kids, a highly coveted and fickle demographic. But to get there, they had to constantly deal with boycotts from advertisers, along with protests from religious and family-oriented morality groups who wanted to take the show off the air. 
All right, TV reviewer, you've gone too far. And who are you to tell us what the hell? No wonder you hate the show. You're everything we make fun of. This, folks, was the source of Drawn Together's eventual downfall. They jeopardized the network's bottom line and could not bring in enough money to justify sticking around. And whatever good faith Comedy Central still had with Jesser and Silverstein was diminishing fast. They assumed that by still maintaining high ratings, Comedy Central would keep backing them up when things got heated. But in the end, the lines they crossed and the enemies they made became too much for Comedy Central to handle. In March of 2007, fans grew concerned after hearing Jesser and Silverstein had begun working on a show for MTV and signed two-year development contracts with 20th Century Fox. Was this really the end of their beloved show? Well, the answer was both yes and no. And folks, this leads us into one of the worst aspects of Drawn Together's history, the horrendous feature-length movie. Now, I am not the first person to mention this train wreck on YouTube, because its reputation is honest to God just that awful. But trust me, the context here is essential in order to understand the complete downfall of Drawn Together. Announced in late 2009, but originally premiering at South by Southwest in March of 2010, the Drawn Together movie, which was titled The Drawn Together Movie The Movie, was intended to be a last hurrah, necessary closure for fans who felt disappointed by the sudden cancellation of their beloved series. Jesser and Silverstein were so intent on making sure the DVD release turned a profit that they passed on their royalties directly to Comedy Central. However, despite the last-minute Hail Mary, what the fans got was an unwatchable pile of garbage that even the most diehard fans hate with a passion. From the very beginning of the movie, the most obvious change is the lower quality of the animation. It was an uncanny downgrade since the studio had a limited $1 million budget to work with for the entire film and opted to have it done in Adobe Flash and Toon Boom to save money. The animation was done by Six Point Harness, the same company behind Wow Wow Wubsy, El Tigre, and Dick Figures. Now, I'm sure that the animation team worked hard on it, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it just looks awful and can't properly capture the same quality fans were used to on TV. Folks, I cannot stress enough how unpleasant, ugly, and boring this movie is. The amount of spite and petulant rage in this film makes it unbearable to watch, with a, a thinly veiled plot devolving into their petty, one-sided rivalry with South Park. The story premise is that the Drawn Together gang discovers that their show has been permanently cancelled in favor of an obvious parody of South Park. Captain Hero dates a corpse because of course he does. Meanwhile, the evil network head sends a robot voiced by Seth MacFarlane named, uh, oh, 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 oh no, the timing here, Israel. Yeah, that's, that's its name. Uh, Israel to erase the drawn together characters from existence. Prepare to be erased. <laughs> Israel must kill you all. I guess Seth MacFarlane owed them a favor or something, because Jesser and Silverstein also wrote on the Cleveland show, so, hmm, not a good explanation, but it's the only one I have. You know, that or maybe a blood oath, who can say? The movie reveals the main cast of characters are canonically doppelgangers of actual iconic cartoon characters. The group meets the new show's rising star, wanting her help. She claims the show can be vulgar as it wants, as long as it makes a point a la social commentary, and joins them on a trip to Mega Point Land, a magical place where they can find relevance again. Clara dies at the halfway point of the movie in a dungeon that features the rhino guards from Disney's Robin Hood for some reason, and Toot is only there for like half of the runtime, living in bedrock and pregnant with Barney Rebel's child, presumably because he could not afford any additional screen time for Tara Strong. The only mystery you've ever solved is the mystery of the empty uterus. <laughs> and everyone dies by accidentally getting erased at the end. There, I saved you 71 minutes of your life. Go read a book instead. Okay, so I'm being mean right now, but hey, uh, so are the producers when they made this travesty. Uh, look, self-awareness doesn't mean anything without tangible signs of improvement. 
Just because you joke about something being crappy or lazy does not mean it's an excuse to not try, especially when you've been given an exceptionally rare second chance to complete the story's ending the way you wanted to. People can tell when you don't put effort into something, and they're not going to mindlessly watch your film just because the Drawn Together's gang is in it. They're here for the comedy, the characters playing off each other, the things that made them keep watching these three seasons of the show on TV in the first place. But the movie threw it all away in a very callous and self-righteous manner. I think the showrunners really struggled with this, as the vibe of the movie is so nasty and bitter that I can't imagine anybody watching it is completely siding with them, including fans. Now, it's entirely possible Jester and Silverstein actually did get a raw deal from Comedy Central, that they were annoyed with the obvious favoritism of South Park by the network, or they were frustrated with the lack of consistent marketing and merchandise available to promote it. In fact, the showrunners bring up this lack of available merch and the season three two-part special, Lost in the Parking Space. Apparently, Jesser and Silverstein had been told by Comedy Central's marketing team that Drawn Together was having an exclusive t-shirt release with the retail store, you guessed it, Hot Topic. Hot Topic? They got everything a suicidal preteen could want. Except for parents who listen. They were beyond pumped, corralling the rest of the staff to go to their local mall and check out the goods. However, the store's clerk had no idea the show even existed, calling it, quote, Drawn to what now? After scrounging around in the back, the team eventually managed to find them. A few officially licensed t-shirts, badly crumpled up and stuck under another box. <laughs> Yeesh. I gotta admit, that's got to be profoundly frustrating. Imagine your show not receiving the same lucrative merchandising opportunities as Family Guy or Invader Zim in the mid-2000s. It's not great for morale at the very least. But I don't know. Uh, how things ended just feels weird and gross to me. Even with all the obvious passion and dedication from the voice actors, looking back on it now, I can't help but feel like the showrunners still squandered what they had. That this movie is them publicly licking their wounds and forcing the audience to watch it scab over in gruesome detail. That they took their success for granted, somehow, somehow got a limited budget for a movie after being canceled and still used that time to crap on the network and complain about a show with better critical reception. Rather than give the fans a more complete and satisfying ending, it's one of the most poorly aged aspects of Drawn Together as a property, exacerbating all of the weakest aspects of it as a show. If you want to talk about a genuinely great screw the network finale, I think the Owl House pretty much nailed it. It's clearly not a one for one comparison as they're obviously super different in subject matter, audience and tone, but they were both massive outliers for their respective networks, with most of their marketing coming directly from the fans word of mouth. Sure, the three part finale for the Owl House is definitely rushed in sections and not every question was answered by the ending but they absolutely worked their asses off on it, kept the show trending online for weeks, and made Disney look like complete idiots for canceling it so abruptly. In contrast, the Drawn Together movie exemplified the worst tendencies of the showrunners, and its failure ended up actually justifying Comedy Central's decision to cancel the show. So, wow, this movie just keeps on going. It's, uh, I hear that. This is a long so, thing. This movie, how do we get out of here? I thought this was actually a bad Shut idea. Shut the fuck up and listen. It, it actually might very well be a bad idea, but um, Dave, Dave, uh, he needed the money. So I had well, to Matt's, do it. Matt married into money. Who the so, hell would ever want to listen to this? In an article promoting the movie from Animation World Network, Jesser and Silverstein addressed their thought process for choosing a twist villain. Quote, the South Park spoof in the movie is a dig at critics who complain that Drawn Together isn't like Stone and Parker's show. But we didn't want to be like South Park. Drawn Together is like the junior varsity team at Comedy Central. South Park is the varsity team. They're clearly the better show. They go after things they hate. We only hurt the ones we love. End quote. <laughs> yeah, you seem really unbothered by it. Regardless, comparing South Park to Drawn Together is like apples and oranges. They're very different, but people can like them for similar reasons. The writing structure for South Park is generally straightforward, 
mostly focusing on a singular A plot. And the real conflict comes from how the characters react to new situations or roadblocks achieving a goal. There's an insightful video on YouTube of Matt and Trey coaching NYU students with their writing process. And it's worth your time if you haven't seen it before. Right, so, so what I'm saying is that you come up with an idea and it's like, okay, this happens, right? And then this happens. No, 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 it should be this happens and therefore this happens. But this happens, therefore this happens. Now, I totally get why some people see South Park as being too preachy or annoying because so much of its humor can be dependent on topical jokes. When it's great, it's because they know how to keep the story consistent and still have enough time to let the jokes breathe. They also use Autodesk Maya to animate each episode, with a team of 70 workers that can get most new shows out within a week. Now that is completely unrealistic for most 2D animated productions, but it's another reason why South Park can respond so quickly to current events, as well as guaranteeing a consistent airing schedule. Mostly, I find this rivalry unfortunate and sad. Drawn Together was a wildly excessive but funny show that had a ton of fans. But how the showrunners handled criticism at the time was childish and embarrassing. If you're going to make a show that relishes in being offensive and dumb, just own it. But you can't be surprised if that results in consequences that makes your show less financially viable. Like it or not, television is an industry geared towards turning a profit first and retaining viewers second. That has only become more obvious with the streaming wars losing subscribers left and right by removing programming to save money. In that regard, I think it's interesting to see so much renewed interest and in drawn together now. There's always been a demand for edgy comedy, but in our current landscape, with everything being sanitized to not irritate brands, there's more of a gray area that separates sincerity and humor versus being provocative and knowing what will get people watching. Yes. Drawn Together was able to use shock and awe to attract an audience, but in the end, it was that very same shock that would be its downfall and lead to its cancellation. Talk about a double-edged sword. Goodbye, cruel world. Ow. In conclusion, Drawn Together was undeniably a product of its time and is a mixed bag of both good but mostly bad. The show wasn't afraid to rock the boat during an era of already vulgar and politically incorrect comedy, but it also didn't have anything all that compelling to say either. It was at the right place at the right time, with basically no filter and everybody to offend. Many people did not take Drawn Together seriously back in the day, because the creators themselves refused to do so. Now, it has the legacy of being a well-animated, but mostly pointless shitpost of a TV series, with a ton of potential, but none of the discipline required to fully take it to the next level. It sucks because I genuinely do enjoy many aspects of the show, but the end of the series and a terrible movie ended up validating their own worst fears. When you live in the shadow of a bigger show, you have to actively work hard to stand out and earn your moment in the spotlight. Being offensive for the sake of just being offensive is indeed a reason to exist. But if you can't demonstrate that you can handle more than that, well, then it's a reason with a brief shelf life. Jesser and Silverstein have gone on to have a number of production and writing credits, most notably the Cleveland show Solar Opposites and Housebroken. However, there's still a huge wake left behind from Drawn Together's cancellation. They've gone on to say that they'd love to do a reboot if given the opportunity, but I doubt anything will come from that, at least not from another mainstream TV network willing to take that kind of risk. Now it's possible that a smaller development company might be willing to give them a shot, but maybe as more of an online property. With the runaway success of Hasbun Hotel and Smiling Friends, two edgy comedy series built from the success of their online creators. The demand for outlandish comedy is definitely still there. It'll just be a matter of whether or not they're able to work in today's ever-changing landscape and whether they genuinely have something to say this time. I'm a goddamn mess! I'm an alcoholic! I have a bit of a temper. I'll cut you, you dirty Polak! And I can't stop eating! Despite its controversies, Drawn Together was beloved by many fans for its edgy and daring humor. The show was designed to challenge societal norms and push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in the cartoon. 
While some people felt that the show went too far in its depiction of controversial topics, others felt that it was a necessary and important voice in the world of animation. Drawn Together was a show that was not afraid to take risks and push the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in a cartoon. While it often resulted in controversies and accusations of insensitivity, the show's creators and fans argued that the show was meant to be a satirical commentary on these issues, and that its humor was meant to challenge and subvert harmful stereotypes. Regardless of one's opinion on the show's controversial nature, there is no denying its impact on the world of animation and pop culture. While causing waves during its initial airing in the mid-2000s, the series went on to be appreciated for its bold nature, unique approach to animation, and surprising moments of levity as the years went on. It was actually named one of the 60 greatest cartoons of all time in 2013 by TV Guide, which, <laughs> by the way, I'm just surprised as you are that TV Guide still existed in 2013. Despite its flaws, Drawn Together was a show ahead of its time. With taboo topics used as a basis for its jokes, which consisted of masturbation, paraphilia, kinky sex, homosexuality, gay marriage, abortion, rape, incest, pedophilia, menstruation, spousal abuse, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, necrophilia, terrorism, graphic violence, and death. The list of problematic content on display in this show reads like a greatest hits of human depravity. In 2004, when the show first aired, the world was a different place. And the fact that I can say something like that about a time I was alive for and recall makes me feel absolutely ancient. The internet was just starting to gain traction and social media was non-existent. This meant that pushback against controversial content was limited to word of mouth and news reports. Today, the social landscape is much different. Any past offense, no matter how small or how long ago, can be uncovered by anyone on social media and result in widespread backlash or even potentially career-ending consequences. This is why it's unlikely that a major company would even attempt to produce a show as daring as drawn together in today's world. The concept of the show alone invites backlash, which is evident in the ongoing discourse surrounding it today. Regardless of facing criticism, Drawn Together became a massive hit, with three seasons and a dedicated fan base. This was largely due to the fact that people were not as sensitive to these types of topics at the time, and there was no platform for open public criticism like there is nowadays with social media. Despite the fact that most of the offensive comedy in the show was trying to be a commentary on the absurdity and the ideas themselves, the tolerance for commentary like that in today's social climate is almost non-existent. Today, social media is like an ongoing popularity contest where everyone is trying to prove how much better they are than everyone else, and individuals are subject to scrutiny from complete strangers at any given moment. Enjoying a controversial show like Drawn Together would not only invite backlash from social media users, but it could also result in an individual becoming persona non grata online. It's doubtful that a show like Drawn Together would even make it past a month of airtime if it was produced today. Talking about one's enjoyment of it publicly online would only invite trouble from the self-righteous and, and judgmental social media mob. In that regard, it seems like an impossibility for a show like this to even exist as an independent web production in today's social climate, let alone run on network television from a major corporation. They just get slaughtered in the court of public opinion. Unless there's a titanic shift in cultural norms, it's doubtful we'll see something as blatantly risque as drawn together anywhere outside of 4chan thread. In the end, Drawn Together isn't timeless, but it's definitely a product of its time. It's a snapshot of the media landscape of the 2000s, and goes to show how much has culturally shifted since then. Perhaps with proper nuance, Drawn Together could have avoided cancellation if it took the same approach as Always Sunny when it came to dark comedy. But the series pushed the envelope in such a way that it was only a matter of time until it would implode. But whether you liked it or not, Drawn Together was definitely a unique experience, and one of a kind. And it will forever be remembered as the most offensive cartoon that ever aired on television. <laughs> it's okay, sweetie. Our long national nightmare is over. He can't hurt us anymore. The important thing is that you survived. We all survived.